Always fun to catch up with our guy, Mac Hollins, working with Special Olympics and uh, maybe working with the Miami Dolphins. Unrestricted free agent, Mac. How how are you handling the uncertainty of what your life will be next year? Good to see you, by the way. I guess guess handling it it, it, well. uh, I would say I'm trying not to focus on it, but it's kind of part of, you know, my career and my future, but I think the work that I put in over the last couple of years has made it where I put myself in at least a good position to hopefully be able to come back and play here for some more years. So four touchdown catches, that's a career high, 16 yards a catch, career high, 65 yard catch. It was a, it's a, a topper. He did that against the jets. And I, I thought, you know, looking at your guys this season, I mean, you're sitting at one and seven. I don't know if you remember what you said at the time, but I'm going to read it back to you right now. Quote, it's easy to scrap the season. It's easy to say we're not going to win anymore. Who cares? Let's just focus on next year. Let's tank. Everyone wants to be treated like a man. Everybody wants to be grown. Everyone wants to be the big dog, this and that. If you want to be all those things, you can't do that type of stuff. Nobody on this team is, and nobody on this team is going to at any point. I certainly won't allow it, nor will the coaches or any of our team captains. And then the Dolphins become the first team in NFL history to uh, win seven straight after losing seven straight. And you end up, you know, winning eight of your last nine. You actually got yourself in playoff position, tough loss against Tennessee. But, you know, overall, I mean, it's not where you ultimately want to be, but that's a hell of a turnaround. Absolutely. And, I, you know, it's unfortunate to start a season like that because, Clearly, there was a lot of potential on that team um, and there's potential in the future. But speaking on just this past year, like there's a, there was a lot of potential. And you you see, I think the young guys realize that in this league, it's the slightest thing that changes a win from a loss. Um, and if you look back and say, oh, if we would have done this on this drive, we would have ended up winning by three or that that spread would have been us up by one instead of down by two, you know. And those are one or two wins that put us in the playoffs and you look back and you're like, I wish this, I wish this, I wish this. Uh, And this league is not a, I wish type of league. Uh, It's a, I did this, I did this, I did this so that this, this, and this happened. Uh, So that's a, that's that's a a learning curve for myself included. You're you're always learning in this league and you're always trying to perform better. So if we could have done better first half, second half wouldn't have had to be so spectacular. Did you guys do anything specifically different to turn it around? I don't think it was much different. Like I'm a big, I'm a big, and this is always uh, a point of controversy in the locker room that I debated with. I think that I was told that when I was in college by a coach that this is a player's game. Uh, no matter, no matter who is your coach, at the end of the day, for those 60 minutes in between those lines, it's the players. I don't think a coach can make a season change at any point. I don't think they can. No matter who you want the coach to be, who you think is the most inspirational, gives the best speeches or knows the best game plan or is the most analytical, they can't change a season. I think it has to be the players. And I think we just narrowed in our focus. We worked and I and I said it in the media and I think it was spun a little bit of the wrong way. Like we weren't working hard enough. We were saying we were. Um, we were working hard. When people say, Are you working hard? Like, are you practicing hard? Yeah, we were. But are you practicing with a purpose? And that's what I meant by it. It was like, are you like I can go and I use this example, like you can go watch a movie, enjoy the movie. You watch the whole thing. But if I were to come to you after and be like, who produced it? Who, who, who said the the line at, at the 12 minute mark? Like, I don't know. I just watched the movie. Like, yeah, you did. You, you enjoyed it. You were up the whole time. It wasn't like you were sleeping during it. You paid attention. And that's, I think, what happens a lot of times in this league is you kind of get in that little I'm just watching film. I've watched it for two hours. So I do know like I know the main plot of their team. I know basically what they do. But do I know what their corner does on third down if he has a safety rolled over the top? Do I know how he acts when he doesn't have safety help? Do I know what his leverage means? You know, what I mean, like very detailed stuff. And I think we we really started to like key in on that stuff. And that that really made a difference. That's like a great reminder to anyone who multitasks at work like are you actually doing it yeah. or is it just kind of on and you're right. you know that's I think a lot of masters as a as a civilization just of doing a million things a little bit rather than one thing really really well which in essence means you're doing nothing exactly All right so so <laughs> so so we need some intention um yeah. why, why do you think you were honored as a team captain 
I don't know. I, I mean, I think I, I've built a good relationship with the entire locker room. And I think that comes from the, the um, you know, my special teams is my, is my background. So those are the guys that interact with everybody, but also my, I'm the weird guy in the locker room. I don't, uh, I'll talk to anybody. I'll hang out with anybody. Um, and I think I, I could, I do a good job at empathizing with people. Uh, I may not agree with everybody, but I'm, I'm a voice. I feel like in the locker room that guys can talk to and be like, how you feel about this, 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 can you talk to coach about this, 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 um, because I don't, I don't want to say I don't care, but like, I don't, that's the word I'm going to use. I don't care how coach reacts. I'm going to tell you how the locker room is feeling. I'm not saying I agree with what the locker room is feeling or I disagree, but I'm going to, I'm going to not be afraid to say this is what they're saying and how you're conducting practices or meetings or whatever it is may make them feel some type of way. And I'm just bringing it across your plate, you know, digest it how you, you may. So I, I think that helped me, but then also I think I, I've started producing more, uh, you know, playing at a higher level and that, the end of the day is the main thing I think in the NFL if you're not producing it's hard to if you're not out on the field it's hard to you know follow a guy who's not in battle I guess um so I think that also had a, a, a good role so you had a really good relationship with Brian then yeah yeah so I, I would always meet with him uh because I think that's important uh I've, when I was young I used to be so terrified to go upstairs and I get why you know upstairs is like that's where you go to turn in your playbook and but as I've gotten older I learned like what's going to be is going to be uh, so going upstairs and building that relationship, it only can help because if they're going to get rid of you, it's, they're going to get rid of you. They're not going to be like, well, he, he comes up here a lot. You know, he's a, I hang out with him. So we're going to keep him. We're just going to keep him on the team like that. It's not going to help you. And it, it, it's, it's not going to like change the way they're going to cut you or not. So I go up there and, and I think, cause it helps the team as a whole. So building that relationship upstairs, talking to all the coaches and seeing what they're feeling like, cause they sit in meetings all day and don't talk to players and they may go the next day and, in the back of their mind, like, oh, we already talked to the players about this, but they didn't realize because they've been in meetings for 10 hours that they didn't relay these messages on the players. They're just assuming the players should know because they know. Um, so that that helped a lot. So, yeah, me and me and Coach Flo were always in, in talks. I would quibble with you just to drop. I mean, obviously, you got to perform on the field. They're, they're not going to keep you around if you can't play. But if you do have the relationship, you know, it's it, it probably doesn't hurt you either. And it just shows, you know, courage or, you know, hey, I'm I'm, I'm oh, yeah. oh, no, it certainly doesn't doesn't hurt you. Uh, I would say, like, definitely go up, go up there. Um, but I think the guys fear that they can't go up there because if they do, then they're going to like you only go up there to get cut or. Yeah. Like, remember, it's talk to them. Normal. They're your so, coaches. So I don't want to put you in any awkward positions here, but I got to ask, like, so you, were you surprised that Brian was let go? Um, I, th- I mean, I think so just because, you know, you, you have winning seasons and, and a coach is let go. And uh, I guess the perception is always, if you have a losing season, you get fired. Um, and if you have a winning season, then you get hired or you stay. Uh, but what I've learned over the five years I've been in the NFL is like, I wasn't fired for long. I was surprised for the hour that I saw the, all the stuff going on. And then it's like, well, that's the NFL. Like, that's just how it goes. You know, you don't know what's going on upstairs. And the biggest thing as a player that I tell all the young guys is stay healthy, make it through training camp and just do what you have to do because things will always be changing. Uh, you can't, you just like a recruit in college, like you can't put all your eggs in one basket. Like I went to this school cause this guy, like this guy is not, this coach is not the reason you play football. Uh, so same as in the NFL, just, you know, just cause the coach gets fired, you can't burn the house down. Like, Oh, everything's over. Do you worry that Brian won't get a chance to coach again? I don't know. Um, I think I, I don't. I guess I wouldn't say I worry. Like it doesn't keep me up at night. Um, but I think that's a real possibility. Hopefully he can because I think he is a good coach. Uh, but I mean, he has his own things he has to deal with. With you know, obviously the lawsuit and stuff. I, players have nothing to like. People ask me all the time, like, you think it happened this and that? Like, we all tanking? Did did he? I'm like, whatever happens upstairs. As I said earlier, people are afraid to go upstairs. We definitely don't know what's going on. Like in backroom conversations, like we're just. We just show up at practice. Nobody's in arguments during practice. Like, so we, everybody's good. Um, so we, yeah, we, we never know about that type of stuff. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, when you got there, uh, you're coming over from the Eagles. It, obviously you get in there, like, I got to prove myself. You're not yeah. thinking, of, you know, I'm not trying to lose. I'm trying to establish myself so I can stay in the league. Right. Oh yeah. And it, I mean, we ended up winning, I think like three of the next four games I was there. So I'm like, I'm like, this, this locker room's like high energy. And I remember like the guys were always like, nah, we're not tanking. Like, People think we're tanking. Like we're making, we clearly had to make a lot of changes. We got rid of like half our roster at the beginning of the year. We got new guys coming in, trying to build something. So it was always, it was never a, hey, we're lo- we're about to lose this game for sure. Like 
coaches came prepared every day to, to work and win. Yep. 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 Mac, you're always talking uh, to us through uh, Special Olympics. I know that uh, a lot of cool things going on. You brought you brought some uh, kids out to a game this year. Uh, that must have been fun. I did. It was it was awesome. Like to be able to see them, and then they all had my jersey on. I didn't even know they all had got my jersey uh, after the game. I got to see them, and they all had it on. It was so awesome. I, some of them played football, and getting to hear the, the positions they play, and listen to them joking and laughing about the the game. And most of them hadn't had never been to a game. And for me to be able to bring them and let, uh, give them that experience is, is so special to me. Yeah. And uh, the unified champion schools, we got to talk to uh, one student last week. Really, really, really cool program. Oh, so incredible. Uh, so I'll, you know, take it back to when I was a kid or a, even when you were a kid, like everything was so separate. It was those intellectual disabilities, like people thought, thought and maybe they're right by research because you can always, it's always evolving, but they should be by themselves and those without intellectual disabilities should be by themselves because that'll help each group grow the most. And what they're finding out now, and what is showing in these unified champion schools is that by having those with and those without intellectual disabilities be together, learn together, play sports together, grow together, interact together. It's, it's helping both sides grow significantly more than when they were separate. Uh, so it's so awesome to see these, these students interact and, the way that they, you, you know, you watch them at the start of the year and then you watch them six months in and you're like, it's a completely different student or a completely different classroom. And it's, I don't know if this is the right way to say it, but it, it's really important for both sides, right? Like, oh yeah. Like that, that's, that's, I think the thing that people overlook. It's not like, oh, okay. Those with intellectual disabilities are getting helped so much. Both sides are getting help without even realizing that they're getting help, which is so great because, you know, it's easy to think, oh, we're just, helping out the those with intellectual disabilities by including them that's not the case like they're helping the students that don't have intellectual dis- disabilities because they're learning how to how to work with each other they're learning what each other needs you know it's not just uh, i'm going to assume what you need because this is what the general public needs i'm i'm going to work with you i'm going to learn how to talk with each other i'm going to learn how the emotions affect uh both sides so there's a lot that goes into it and it's just building both sides of great well, and you hear it from parents all the time and, and every parent wants their kid to be quote unquote normal. But then you also hear from parents of, of ch- children with, with intellectual disabilities that they're the greatest gift I've ever had. And I'm not saying, and I don't, I, you know, I haven't experienced it, but I'm not saying it doesn't come with the world of challenges, but the, the reward of it all, you know, it's just, there, there's a, there's a beauty there that I think is at least uh, worth trying to understand. Right. Absolutely. And I think that, I think it goes to, those kids usually put life in perspective for a lot of parents. Um, because if you, you think of parents, I think a lot of times they find out their kid has intellectual disabilities before the birth or whatever that may be. I think they immediately go into this panic mode of life is going to be so horrible. We're never going to be able to do anything like this. This child's life is going to be so bad. Everybody's going to be on them all the time. And when they have the child and they realize what a gift they are, how much they're able to do, the things that they're able to do, the, the normalcy of the life they can live, and then how genuine they are. They, they say how they feel. They're going to, like, if you're, if you're a jerk to them, they'll, t- they'll tell you, like, they have no motives. We were talking about LA earlier and, like, how people have, have ulterior motives and trying to do this and that. They have no alter, they, all they want to do is, is ha- have a friend, be a friend. Um, so I think a lot of parents realize that once they have the child and now, now they have school systems where people are accepting of those with intellectual disabilities. So the parents don't even have to worry about, oh, when they go to school, it's going to be so bad. I need to homeschool or whatever that may be. Uh, So I think we've evolved and we've grown so much over the last even five years that it's even more of a gift because you, it's, it's not only at home that it's a gift. It's also whenever, whenever my child leaves, I don't have to worry about, oh, she or he may be getting made fun of or anything like that. Yeah. You mentioned uh, L.A. Let me get a couple football questions in on the way out here. What was your favorite part of the Super Bowl? Um, I didn't watch the whole thing. So I flew back, got back at like five ish. Um, Did you miss the halftime show? I did not see the halftime show either. Okay. I heard, okay. I, heard I got mixed reviews. I heard it was the greatest one ever. I got, it was, the, it was not good. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Ba- basing on who performed, I would assume younger kids thought it was horrible. Everybody else was like, oh, this is the greatest thing ever. Yeah, uh, but I'll have to, I'll have to check. I'm sure I'll see some clips, but I'm not, I really don't watch a like, game football very much like TV, TV uh, football. 
because I, I can't enjoy it. And I think if you're whatever profession you're in, it's hard to watch that profession because all I'm doing is like, well, why do you do this? Or you should have done this. Like, why would you make that decision? See that I always thought the guys would be like that. Why do I want to watch the Super Bowl if I'm not playing in the Super Bowl? It's going to just irk me, and I, yeah. I might as well. I mean, for you, you probably want to go out and get the jugs machine out. You you got that you got that in your garage, right? Oh yeah, believe me, I was I was in it this morning. Five hundred catches already. Get more in an afternoon. Like you just, I I watch it to turn the hunger back on. I guess to to amp me up to get me going a little bit more. Uh, but it's I, I got t- uh, former teammates and buddies that played on uh, on both sides. So it's uh, that's one good thing is you know to see your teammates and friends succeed is is pretty awesome. Yeah. Did the 17 game schedule impact you more or less than you thought? Well, I'm a wussy when it comes to the cold. So pushing <laughs> anything further, further into the cold is, is not up my alley, but it didn't, it didn't impact me like terribly. I think maybe I'll figure that out in a couple of years if I'm fortunate enough to play. And then those added, like how those added games change. Cause I think if you take a preseason game away, that doesn't really matter because it, nobody plays in at least one of the preseason games anyway, like, based on your reps for game one, two, three, like the starters first, second string are kind of rotating where you add up to not playing one game. So you weren't playing that game anyway, but then you added a real one at the end of the season, basically where right. when it's crunch time. Uh, so I, I don't know if that was an equal trade, but that's obviously a much bigger uh, debate than, than we have time for. Yeah. Well, January 9th, you're playing new England. I mean, that's uh, you know, that ain't September. Yeah. So and I, we debate on that too. Like, why do, why do they even allow people to schedule stuff up North? Like the players don't want to play up North. You should always play in the most Southern team or the warmest team at that time of year. Like we should never play new England or New York in November, December, like second half of the season, we should play our first two games there when it's nice. And then the last two games should be down here. That'd be too logical. Yeah. It, it makes <laughs> sense. We don't do it. <laughs> uh mac let me just tell you i hope you if you want to stay in miami that's cool um i hope they give you a contract that you're like oh sweet but if not you know chicago we're, we're having a I and mean, that's where i'm you know based here and, and they're having a whole turnover here get some leadership they could use a little bit of depth at uh wide receiver i think you can make an impact with the bears i'm just saying uh, you never you never know this, this league is always always ever changing so you never know okay well, hey, uh, are you going to be out of the street with the jugs later? I know you get the, the neighborhood kids going too, right? I will indeed. They're, they know it's <laughs> off season, so it's time to work. As soon as they get out of school, it's right over to Max's house. Grab a pool noodle. Grab a pool wailing. noodle. So they, so they hit on you? and Yeah. And, start, and you come, just, come get your, your energy out so then your parents ain't got to deal with your high, high sugar rush. You know how cool that is for them, right? NFL well, I love, player. Yeah, I, love, I, love, I love being able to do it because then they always, as soon as their friends come over, they're like, oh, that's Mac. Can I have your autograph? I'm like, you live next to me. What do you need my autograph for? Like, we hang out all the time, <laughs> so they have fun with it, and I and I get a better better for it. So yeah, yeah, that's uh, just I I love that. That's awesome. You know, back in the day, uh, and I'll we can end here, but back, you know, Michael Jordan, he used to have a house on a regular street. Kids would just like come over there. He'd be uh, he'd be at the door handing out. He used to give like Big Mac cards for for oh, Halloween. Uh, that, this is like late '80s, so right. but before he built his gate and whatnot. But he was just in the neighborhood. So you're in the neighborhood. Yeah, I'm just in the neighborhood. I'll try to stay in the neighborhood as long as I can. Yeah. No. All right. Hey, Matt, great to see you working with Special Olympics. Really uh, uh, just awesome to catch up with you, man. So, Thank congrats, you so much, con- Mark. Congrats on all the career highs this year. Thank Even you. better next year. Let's go. Absolutely, Mark. I'll talk to you soon.